Welcome to Second Opinion, the review show here on the Nexus. I am your host today, Ryan Rampersad, and I will be talking to you all about the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO86. Welcome back to another episode of Ryan Reviews Phones that are really expensive. Today we're going to talk about the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. That is the almost certainly most expensive phone that Samsung has sold in a mainline series ever. Now before we get into the good parts, we have to do a little bit of housekeeping first. And we're going to change up the order from a typical phone review just a tiny little bit. Okay, so let's talk about six months ago. Six months ago, I reviewed the Note 10 Plus, and I had been using it. I almost never used the stylus, as I always say, but then always regret not having. Take a listen to that episode, because a lot of the concepts that I talk about there in that episode apply here. The Note line is kind of the accumulation of lessons learned in every generation. It's also usually the most powerful, in quotes, even though it uses the same processor. It usually has a little bit more RAM or storage than the uh, S-Line does because it is intended for this pro or at least prosumer audience. Well, of course, we have the Samsung S20 Ultra now, which is sort of in this weird, like, overreaching space, this, this strange territory where it is simultaneously more expensive than even the Note 10 Plus, but doesn't have the pen, and actually, it has internally a few less things that the Note 10 did have. So listen to that episode, and you can kind of compare and contrast what that looks like. Now, of course, we have to just begin by talking about the price. It's insane. Uh, base model of the S20 Ultra costs $13.99. That's a little bit expensive. Uh, that is computer territory, good computer territory, uh, to say the least. Now, there's another BTO, or at least SKU, of this Ultra model for another $200, and you get some additional RAM and storage for that. I don't think that's super necessary. It's not that important. But it is interesting to note. Haha, <laughs> note. Now, uh, one important thing, of course, is that I did a trade-in for this phone, so I did not actually pay $13.99. I actually paid seven ninety nine by trading in an S10 Plus for $600. Now, that is a good value. That is kind of the reason I do these phone hops every single year, because I do get the uh, value that's in the phone swapped over to the new one. So that, that is good. So somehow, uh, after all of the fees and taxes and so forth, I paid about eight fifty, And that is kind of the cost of a flagship phone, uh, at, at, at its high point that I think should exist. But I had to have had another phone beforehand to do that trade-in. So people will always say that the Ultra is really expensive. It is. But it is attainable if you do a lot of phone swapping over time. Now, of course, you could not swa swap in, you could not trade in uh, a, an S9 Plus or an S8 Plus for the same $600 trade-in value, you couldn't do it. So it does leave you to wonder who's really buying this phone and why. I think, uh, and I was quite disappointed to see this year that Samsung didn't follow the uh, Apple you know, 10, uh, 10 Pro, 10 Pro Max pattern of pricing, where there was a standard phone, and then a better standard phone, and then a huge phone. And... They all could start at a thousand dollars. Uh, like the middle could start at a thousand, and then there was a, you know, eight hundred, and then there was a twelve hundred. I would have been much more inclined to say that that was a good pattern if they had done it, and they didn't. Let's talk about some more boring stuff. For the full full list of specs for the S twenty Ultra, I have linked various uh spec sheets. Uh, so you can just go and compare there. But I will call out that it is super duper heavy. This phone is heavier than any other phone that I've had for the past few generations. And it's not just because it's bigger physically. It's a microscopically bigger than the Note 10 Plus that I previously was using. But because it is more glass and the modem is presumably bigger and heavier and there's more battery. So 
Uh, take a look at the spec sheet. It is kind of fun to see. Uh, take a look at the spec sheet of the Note 10 Plus to compare it for that, or the S10 Plus to compare for that. Could be fun. Now, the S20 Ultra has a Snapdragon 865 processor. This is an expensive processor. It has been uh, described as being the most expensive processor that Samsung has ever sold. And the reason for that is because it is tied together with the 5G modem. And there is no way to, by default, get that decoupled. So you have to pay for the modem, even if you don't want the 5G modem. In addition to that, the modem isn't a single chip. It's the 865 and the modem together aren't a single chip. They're a package. So battery life, of course, is hit, and internal space is hit, so it has to be a little bit bigger and so forth. Uh, the entire device is just more expensive because of this. So that's great. Perfect. Uh, an interesting thing is that this has the same amount of RAM as the S10, or the Note 10 had. The S10 had 8 gigs, Note 10 had 12, and this also has 12. For for the most part, I think that's okay. I I kind of wish that it had some uh, just a higher amount uh but that may mean that the note 20 plus if that's what they call it will have 16 by default i guess we just have to see now as an alternative you can pay the extra 200 dollars and you can get 16 gigs total so an extra four uh for ram you're never going to know that this ram is meaningful or a problem to you it doesn't matter one interesting software and like user land feature of having all this RAM, though, of course, is you can now pin apps in memory indefinitely. So after their first load, they'll hang out in RAM and not get uh, deprioritized by other usage. Uh, in practice, I I won't do that. Now here's here's my spec my spec bummer, and I'll I'll tell you here. So the Note 10 Plus had 256 gig base model. This S20 Ultra only has a 128 gig base model. Um, I think that's a shame. I think it should have been spec higher by default. Uh, if you're going to be paying more than $1,000, you should be getting a 256 gig. The higher end $200 plus model has 512 gigs base storage, but I don't want to really pay that for this. If you're paying $1,399, I should just be getting 512 I think. The Ultra here... The value isn't matching the price and the, 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 the extra value needed to get to where the value should have been is sort of the, 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 the part that kind of sours everything up here. So yeah, I, I guess it's it's interesting and kind of a shame that the storage didn't match the note. And that's kind of how I always see the progression. So the, the note expands to the new normal of the next generation of the S line. And it didn't quite do that here. And I think it's a regression. And I hope they reconcile that with the note line coming later this year. If it does, we'll see. Okay, so now it's time to talk about fun stuff. We're done with specs. We don't have to talk about those ever again. We're just going to breeze through this list because it's a phone, and you know all about phones. Don't worry about it. The screen is gigantic at 6.9 inches diagonal, but here's how that works. The aspect ratio is slightly different this time. It is 20 by 9 now. So it's really tall, but the Note 10 Plus was almost also as tall, just a uh, slight hair shorter, but the Note 10 Plus was a tiny bit wider, and it, in, in, in fact, was almost too wide for me. The width of this phone, of the S20 Ultra, is perfect. It is wide, but not. it is just a little bit less wide than would be uncomfortable, so it's in a perfect spot for me. Uh, so the screen, it's beautiful. It's big. Let's talk about some of the special screen features, of course, though, right? It is using Samsung's 2020 screen process. It is a gorgeous screen. Very clear, very simple. Uh, all of our favorite display features are still around, such as the built-in fingerprint scanner, such as, um, ambient display. Um, just, just great. In addition, of course, it has new features such as 120 hertz refresh rate and 240 hertz input rate. Now, let's talk about the input rate first. I have no idea if it is meaningful whatsoever. It 
could be cool. It could be more useful on the note if you're using the pen. Now let's talk about the 120 hertz refresh rate. Yeah, could be cool. No way to know. Uh, out of the box, for some reason, the phone comes with 1080p and 60 hertz refresh rate. You can customize to that either, and it's an exclusive or, either to 1440p at 60, or you can customize that to 1080p at 120 hertz refresh rate. But not both at the same time yet, at least. Uh, we can talk about battery life in this regard a little bit later, but suffice it to say, when you're at the store and you're looking at the phone and you bring your um, really slow Moto G phone right next to it and you swipe across your Facebook feed, yeah, you might notice, but once you use it daily, like my, I cannot tell. Like I, I, I use other phones day to day for work and stuff, and I, I cannot tell. I have no idea. Um, I can't even tell the difference between 1440p and 1080p. Like uh, I, I'm blind. I guess I, I have no way to tell. So if you're buying this phone to have a revolutionary leap in screen resolution or quality, you're not, you're not going to see it. In my opinion. Unless you're one of those people who can. If you don't know that you can see it, don't come here looking for it. Because you probably won't. If you haven't seen it in another device already, you might not see it here. Um, let's talk about the physicals of the phone. So, it's a little bit smaller than the Note 10 Plus, which is nice. It is quite a bit heavier. It's probably the heaviest phone that I've ever had. And that, of course, is because of its additional glass its uh, additional battery, and probably the modem, because it's two pieces instead of one, it all adds up to being a tiny little bit heavier. Check the uh, spec sheets for more. Now, the battery is at 5,000 milliamp hours, which is a lovely number. Uh, I believe that is up from 4,500 in the Note 10 Plus. The Note 10 was giving me wonderful battery life every single day. I was getting through the day, and I had between, well, like, the the high 40s to mid 30s and I was never strapped for battery and I knew if I was I could put it on either a wireless charger or even a slow charger and it would get back up to above 50 or 60 within you know 20 to 30 minutes and I would be totally fine I have never been constrained by the 4500 milliamp hour battery of the Note 10 plus in this phone despite having 5g uh, and despite having a bigger screen Day over day, when you're going through regular out-of-home office work, I was probably getting somewhere around the same. Um, it was probably low 40s to low 30s. And I think that's okay. Um, having switched over to a more uh, at-home-centric working pattern where I'm always in Wi-Fi range and never on 5G for the most part, I'm now getting about... <laughs> Uh, 70% at work end and down to maybe like 50% at the end of the day. And I think that's fine. Uh, last night, I believe I went, went to sleep with, uh, 60%. So it is totally fine. If you end up not using the phone, um, on 5G or with the new modem at all, you're, you're never going to notice. Allegedly, this is 45 watt compatible, uh, super fast charging again, just like the Note 10 Plus was, but it doesn't matter because it's not included in the box, and so who cares? I still charge with my HP Touchpad's power brick every night because I think it's hilarious, and it still charges just fine. Um, ports are all the same, of course. Uh, the uh, S10 loses one port, I guess, if you consider that from the S10 Plus perspective, it loses the headphone jack. The buttons, I always thought the Note 10 Plus buttons were perfect where they were. They had moved those buttons to the left-hand side, and of course, you know, they, they called out the dedicated Bixby button for the Note 10 Plus generation, and that was great. Samsung learned in that regard, but putting them on the left side was really convenient because my phone always faces towards my leg in my left hand pocket so I could take the phone out and hit the power button 
as I was taking it out with my thumb as I was picking it up. Uh, let's talk about 5G real quick. It is sort of a marquee feature of this phone, but it is of no consequence to me at this time. Uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't actually matter in real life. Uh, it is cool to see 5G in the top corner whenever you're out and about. Uh, I've never seen it say anything other than 5G. I've never seen it switch to LTE or maybe 3G. I don't even know if there are 3G towers on T-Mobile anymore. Um, it's identical in everyday life to me with the um, LTE signals that I had been getting previously. I think what's really happening here is T-Mobile says anything that used to be LTE but in a 5G phone is now just listed as 5G. I think that's what's happening. I don't know that for sure, but I think so. Now, the S20 Ultra is a little bit different than the other two models in the S20 lineup. This does also have millimeter wave bands in its modem, which means that if somehow T-Mobile pulled to Verizon, it could offer ultra-fast multi-gigabit speeds within line of sight of a tower. Okay, now this is the moment you've all been waiting for. This is camera time. How many cameras does this phone have again? Well, if you do the math and you count everything that could be a camera and that looks like a camera in some form or another, there's five. So there's the front camera. There are the three back cameras that are actually cameras. And then there's also the time of flight depth sensor. But if you only count back cameras that are really cameras that take pictures, there's only three cameras on the back. So everybody was freaking out when the phone was released about how many cameras it, it would have or does have. Um, let's just go with there's three. So you've got it's just it's just an obscene amount of cameras, really. And it, it, we'll talk about why it's really confusing. But you've got the 108 megapixel camera. You've got the Periscope Zoom 48 megapixel camera, and you've got the 12 megapixel wide angle. Okay, so now with all of that said, how is it? Well, it's remarkably average. If anything, coming from the S10 Plus or the Note 10 Plus, it is a side grade, if anything, at all. And initial impressions have said to me that it is often a slight downgrade in many situations in which I was able to take pictures just fine before. So my initial impressions have been that any subject movement, for example, a cute dog, uh, would cause blur. And that is a problem because dogs do move and blur is bad. Now, the Note 10 Plus was not perfect in any regard in taking pictures, but it always looked pretty good. And if the subject was fairly steady, with minor movement, it would be okay. Obviously, a stationary subject is always going to take a better picture with a camera like this. In pro mode, it is often just 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 capable to set your your shutter speed and your ISO and you know whatever else is available in such a way that you can get a good shot. But in auto mode, I feel like the Note 10 Plus was taking some better pictures more of the time. Yeah, well, there are other problems too. So the depth of field of the primary 108 megapixel camera, that has a serious issue. It has a so shallow depth of field that if you're taking a picture of words on a printed sheet of paper, like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and you sort of focus on the middle of the page, the words towards the top and the words towards the bottom will be just ever so slightly gone from focus, which is sort of a departure from other camera phones, phone cameras, I don't know, uh, that I've used in the past because those have a depth of field that is practical. <laughs> so, you know, it could be sort of an expectation thing. But it is it certainly has been an adjustment to make. Uh, and finally, the, the default settings leave a lot to be desired with regards to scene optimization. Samsung seems to believe that 
uh, the AI can do a better job at setting settings than I can. And maybe that's true, but because I don't know what settings it's taking, I can't learn from it. And so it's just trying to do whatever it wants, and I refuse to let it do that. Uh, I guess there could be a fourth bullet point here, and I could say that um, by having JPEG be the default and not letting me set what default JPEG quality that is, it kind of limits what the quality ends up being. You can go to that other uh, high efficiency format, but I, I chose not to for the most part because there are no devices in the world other than phones that can read those formats. Windows can't, and I don't think Mac OS can. Now, you can set a pro mode option where it will give you the RAWs for pro shots, which I do turn on and use. Okay, so that's, that's those are all the initial impressions. Now, what about real life usage? Let's talk about special modes, such as the 100, 100x zoom. 100x zoom. Can you believe it? So how is that accomplished? Well, first of all, that is accomplished with the revolutionary approach of combining digital zoom with optical zoom. Wow. Uh, allegedly, it's actually kind of cool. So in the show notes, I have provided to you a Google Photos album of a photo that I took at the local Menards which is a lovely hardware store right down the street. So in the first photo, you can take a look at um, some some signs for pricing. You can see that there's some pricing about like uh, $7.79, $6.39. Uh, it's just some price signs. Now in the second photo, you can see what the unzoomed version of the same position was. So with with and I and I don't know for sure which zoom level I took this at. Uh, maybe maybe info can tell me. It 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 says um, nineteen millimeters. So there might be a way for some uh, some some expert to figure out what the zoom level on that was, but I don't know. Uh, but it it is pretty close to fantastic at actually doing zooms. So if you looked at that picture and you zoomed in on that picture, you can kind of make out some of those numbers from the zoomed in regular picture, but doing the actual optical zoom really does work. Now, I did play with this in other settings, uh, but I only have these two good pictures for comparison. Uh, I took a picture of some license plates from the 14th floor of my office building. That was actually really cool. Uh, there is no way to do that on other phones. The Note 10 Plus could not have done that. Uh, I'll give you that. Now, could you pick up a $99 pair of binoculars and do the same thing? Are there binoculars for $250 with a built-in camera? So, all in all, this whole Zoom thing, I don't know, it doesn't really matter much to me. Uh, I think if you gave everybody, you know, a 100x Zoom, and you told everybody, like, yeah, 100x zoom looks kind of awful. Um, we'll put a like danger red line on the slider, the zoom slider, where it's it, the quality degrades after you get up above some threshold. I think that would be fair. And so maybe people would kind of focus on the 30x to 50x zoom as sort of being the sweet spot. Um, the other part that's kind of weird is that. It's not clear to me when the zoom functionalities kick in between the different lenses. So there are three lenses, and of course I mentioned them earlier. There's the 48 megapixel telephoto, there's the 108 megapixel, and there's 12 megapixel. Which one is used in any of that zoom stuff? And the answer is somebody knows, but it's not me. I think what happens at 5x it must be still using digital zoom. But once you go up to 10x, it switches to optical zoom. And if you go back down after you've been at 10x to 5x, it will use optical zoom still. I don't know. The whole thing is a disaster show. I almost never zoom on anything ever. I do for fun remember that I can do some stupid zoom stuff with this phone, and I try it. But it never really matters to me. It's not, not something I do much. Um, I did have some fun with it, of course, recently at the wonderful play that I went to 
in March, which of course uh, I found uh, our good friend of the show, Ian R. Buck, there, and I took a picture of him in the uh, sound booth, and that was kind of uh, kind of fun. Yeah, you know, you, your phones could zoom, so might as well use it. Okay, but the fun doesn't stop there. We also have the 108 megapixel zoom. This features pixel binning. Can you say HTC Ultra Pixels? <laughs> They're back! Uh, and it's still mediocre sometimes. So this is the camera, I believe, that is the main camera with the very shallow depth of field that has been a problem for this phone. Uh, in many reviews, it's been a problem for me. It's just a problem. And I don't know... I don't know how Samsung tests modules they put in phones. I don't know how that works in, in, in an industry like that. Uh, it would seem to me that there would be a, a room full of objects with notable uh, lighting setups and zoom setups and focus setups, and you would test thoroughly in all situations you can imagine how a certain module performs. And maybe to Samsung at the time, it was sufficient. But in real life, the depth of field if issue is, is, is still present. Uh, it is kind of cool that you can switch between raw 108 megapixels and binned 12 megapixels. And uh, maybe it can do somewhere in between of that. I don't know. It is cool that you can do that. Let's just be clear. Super duper cool. Big fan. But... The interface goes out of its way to tell you nothing about how to do that in real life. So if I go into the camera app right now, okay, I'm in the camera app. I have my phone pointing at the monitor with my show notes. How am I able to tell which camera it will use? Will it use the 108? Will it use the telephoto? Will it use wide angle? You don't get to know. Uh, will it use raw 108 or will it use binned 108? Again, you just don't know. Yes, you can find out and you can learn how to use it, but the signaling to the user is very poor. Not a big fan of that. I think it's important to also acknowledge night mode. That's not a new mode for this uh, S20 Ultra. I believe it came out on the S10 Plus and the Note 10 Plus last year. Not a big deal, but I think it's still interesting to talk about night mode because, man, it sure is cool and it sure does work. Okay, and finally, we have to talk about the 40 megapixel selfie camera. I guess it's cool. Anyway, the verdict about the camera. The verdict about the camera is do not buy this phone for the cameras. I I don't understand how to use them. They don't understand how to be used. The predictability with the focal length and what was recently fixed by an update but is still sometimes a problem the focus hunting, which is probably caused by the shallow depth of field issue, I would say don't buy the phone for the camera. The S10 Plus and the Note 10 Plus had better cameras in some ways. And here's my explanation for that. And here's what I've read. The S10 and Note 10 lines had shared cameras between the two. So they might have been slightly tweaked and so on and so forth. But the software and the camera modules were shared for the most part between the two. And the module line, which I think it was a Sony IMX sensor, had been used for a number of years and in other devices. And there was probably some good uh, good, good software, good, good data models, good uh, team understanding and so forth about how to tweak them and use them and how to write software for them. This may be the first time that anybody has used this 108 megapixel sensor. And I think Samsung even made it, but because it is still the first time, and you know what they say about first gen products of anything. Like, yeah, it's a beta, but in real life. Like, it's not the same. And I think that's what we're seeing here. The software just hasn't caught up yet. Uh, the other thing I would say is the ultra wide camera, which is the 12 megapixel. Um, I believe that was a 13 megapixel sensor previously. And I love the ultra wide. I actually use that significantly more than zooming. And I use that because sometimes something is just slightly out of frame and it will capture just a tiny little bit more. 
And I think that's great. Big fan. Well, its resolution went down this time. That should be kept up. You could sacrifice some zoom to keep 12 megapixels up. Uh, I find it too confusing to even know which camera any individual mode or setting will trigger on the phone. If you're going to have more than two cameras and the mode division isn't totally obvious to the user, especially to a regular user, I think that's bad. And then finally, the way that the physical camera bump on the phone is, is obnoxious. It is just a little bit too low for me to use um, because it, the camera bump physically protrudes to where my finger would be in a natural holding position, so I'm always hitting the camera glass. Imagine that, back in the good old days of the S8 camera and fingerprint sensor alignment. Uh, but then the other problem is, because of all of those cameras and extra glass up on top, the phone is top-heavy. So I used to be able to balance the phone sort of by putting my fingers midway up the phone to kind of balance it in my hand. But the glass is there, so I have to go even higher, pushing me further onto the glass. It's a ergonomic disaster. I think we should talk about software for just a brief moment. We'll get... Android 11 on this phone, the Galaxy S20 Ultra, for $13.99, we'll get Android 11 sometime next February in February of 2021. We will. Like, there is no doubt. It's kind of Samsung's fault, and it's also kind of Google's fault. Google releases a stable build of Android very late into the summer, usually. And, of course, even when they do release it, they have a boatload of bugs and, of course, if Samsung were to actually take that bug build of Android 11 and apply it directly to their phones, they would be stuck with it for a year. So they usually wait until Google has fixed some of those bugs with some of their um, not-so-well-defined random updates that are either in the form of security updates or in the form of, ta-da, random update, we don't have a number for it because we don't do that anymore. It's also kind of Samsung's fault because they do have a customized skin still, even though the um, One UI is a nicer skin than the Samsung Experience or even TouchWiz, and it certainly is better. It is still a skin, and that does require some deep customization that they surely have to do still. I don't know, Android 11 isn't super appealing to me, and new Android versions are never almost important at this point. Uh, you get features through the ecosystem and not necessarily through Android itself. Um, but it is a shame that this phone that came out now won't have the new version of Android for a, literally a physical year. Uh, and, and that is a bummer. Uh, but the bigger bummer in the software line here is the third-party launcher support for the new gestures that Google has unveiled and that is available on, of course, uh, Pixel phones, either through the stock launcher or through third-party launchers when they made that update uh, in uh, January. Those features for third-party launcher support for those new gestures, those are still forthcoming. It's still not here uh, in the Samsung OS for One UI. And allegedly, it's coming in One UI 2.5, which would coincide with, of course, the Note 10 launch. I mean, the Note 20 launch, if that exists. But... This year's been a little bit weird already, so who knows if they're just going to say, nah, we'll skip a year. I, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, you know, updates are a funny thing with these Samsung phones. Of course, I bought, and I always buy, an unlocked phone. The unlocked phone, of course... I always buy an unlocked phone when I buy these Samsung phones. And, of course, the unlocked phones, they only get updates after all the U.S. carriers have also gotten their updates for the device. So that is to say, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, uh -huh, rest in peace, and Verizon must update their S20s first with whatever junk they want to do to it and approve it and so on forth. They must do that first, and then the unlocked versions can do it instead. Well, it's great. So that means any time there's an update and we have to wait an extra two to three weeks, if that, 
to get the update. Now, uh, a camera update came to me about three weeks into ownership of this phone. Uh, it fixed the um, focus hunting of the main camera, which was some, somehow an improvement. Uh, it doesn't necessarily fix the depth of field, but it does help a little bit, I suppose. I think there's a lot of room here for improvements on the camera front. Um with regards to somehow mitigating the depth of field issue and improving focus hunting. Um, and also just making which cameras being used clearer, because I still still don't understand. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's that's all I have to say on the update and OS front. Uh, and it's always just fun to mention performance. The Snapdragon 865, yes, it's really expensive, but it is surely no joke. It is a good chip. It's fast. Doesn't seem to run hot. It's uh, it's handling 120 hertz just fine. Um, I I don't believe that if I do receive an update in the future where there is a 1440p plus 120 hertz mode, I don't believe the chip would crumble, and I don't think battery life would tank so much that it would be impossible. I would try it for a week and then revert if it did. But you know, we'll often talk about Snapdragon chips being very inferior. But for generic people, 865, it's it's the best chip you can get. So go for it. Okay, final thoughts. Gotta gotta wrap this up. Don't buy this phone at full price. Thirteen ninety nine is ridiculous. This phone should have been a thousand dollars. I know that. Samsung knows that. Everybody knows that. Lovely time for a uh, really expensive phone in an economic and societal downturn. It's a really big and heavy phone. Consider not getting a really big and heavy phone. Consider the S20 Plus or maybe even just the S20. They don't have absurd zoom capabilities, but they do work. So there's something to say about that. And finally, uh, let's conclude with a funny story. And I have been thinking about a lot of things since I bought this phone. I've been thinking about this story in particular since I've bought this phone. And here it is. In 2016, I bought the Pixel XL1, uh, and somehow I decided to, at the time, and I remember where I was. I was sitting in my lunchroom at my office, and I was eating lunch, and everybody was talking around me about whatever things they were talking about, something about Game of Thrones or something, and um, I remember waiting to buy my phone. It had been just after the announcement. Uh, it's time to buy and the site hadn't crashed and it hadn't run out. And I decided to buy, for some reason, the extra storage variant, which I think was 128 gig, up from 64. Maybe it was up from 32 because Google's crazy. And somehow, <laughs> that phone came out to be, after all the fees and taxes, to be $950. That's crazy that a Pixel XL first gen cost more than and and sure we can give all the flack we want to the s20 ultra but it is by far multiple magnitudes better than the pixel xl1 even if you don't like things bigger or even if you don't like the camera or even if you don't like something about how samsung does their software it is in every way a better phone if you were to have paid 950 dollars for it uh, and of course, with the trade-in, that is still cheaper. My $850 payout to Samsung for this phone. That is an appropriate value. In a hypothetical world where my S20 Ultra cost $1,000, and if they let me buy it for $850 because I traded in my S10 Plus, that's only like roughly $150 off. That would have been okay. These phones should not have been so expensive. Every phone in the line should have been subtracted by $300. Like that's that's the story. That's that's what should have happened. And you contrast that with the Pixel XL back in the day, four years ago. Well, I guess that's where we land. Four years is a long time, but it doesn't feel that long.
So what are we looking forward to next? Well, the Note 10 Plus came out last August, so we might assume that the Note 20 Plus will come out this August. Um, we'll see if the world is put back together by then, and if it is, well, we'll take a look at it. If the Note 10 Plus is dramatically more expensive than $1399, I will very, very strongly consider not buying it. That's pretty much the review for the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. Uh, thank you for listening. It's always fun to talk to you about phones. Uh, where can you find me on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at RyanMR, and of course, on my website at RyanRampersad.com. Uh, you can visit our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV, and you can chat with me about this phone and ask me all the questions that you have ever wanted to ask about an expensive phone. And of course, you can follow us on Patreon and even support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.